Hello, welcome to Gary Boyd at Extra Time. We launched a new Wednesday show a month or so ago in the company of Sky Sports commentator Seb Hutchison. I'm delighted Seb's back after he commentated on Nottingham Forest 2-0 win against Aston Villa on Sunday. So we're going to get Seb's thoughts on that game and looking ahead to uh, a few other matches he'll be commentating on for the Reds. Seb, good to have you back. How are you? Yeah, very good. Very good. I'm sure you're delighted at the moment after the weekend. I am, I am. And you got a lot of love at the weekend for not commentating over Moll of Kintyre. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you've ingratiated yourselves with Reds fans even more. So it's good to have you back on. Um, what did you make of the game from a, a neutral's point of view, first of all? It's interesting. Like I'm, We were all saying Forest are brilliant, you know, best performance of the season. But I suppose there's always yeah. that balance between Forest are great, Villa weren't so great. What, what did you make of it? Yeah, I, th- I thought the get the, I could say the occasion was quite unique as well. So his young Caden Story mm. doing the last post beforehand. That was quite an emotional moment, actually. I thought, you know, such a young boy. And then the way that the situation to see the players gather around him. And when I initially saw it, I saw all the Forest players gather around him. But then after that, the Villa players joined in as well. Mm. And I just thought that's just such, an, such a lovely moment. Because essentially everyone recognised how young this boy was. And how special it was, Forest supporter, but also it being a poignant moment as well, considering what, what it's all for. And that was a touching moment. And then it rolled into Moloch Entire. And it felt an interesting game, a unique game in the fact that Villa had come into that game as favourites mm. because of the form they'd been on. Now, a lot of that form was based on Villa Park. But we were expecting something from Villa. We thought, is it going to be a game where they go away from home and they're going to blow a team away? because they looked like they were scoring goals for fun. And it didn't take long into the match to realise, oh, hold on a minute. This, I don't think this is going to play out like this. Forrest seemed to have... Steve Cooper, the, what, the work he'd done before that game, he had it all worked out. And all he needed was for the players to implement it to be successful. He could see straight away the plan. They were breaking at pace. They were exploiting that high line. And then the defensive base was excellent. And I think that was the most impressive part of Forrest's performance was the defence. The centre-back pairing were fantastic. And I kept pointing out in comms, I was laughing with uh, Alan Smith about it because you say sometimes, you know, defenders don't get the headlines that attackers get. But there was something to really love about both Murillo and Nicarte's performance. Um, they just got everything right. There was an incident towards the end of the first half where there was a handball appeal. And part of me was thinking, oh, surely it can't be Murillo. Surely it can't be him. He's had the perfect half. And actually, when you looked at it, it just missed his hand. And the question mark was more on Toffolo than it was on him. Um, but, but I thought Murillo was fantastic. But near Carte, again, he was right tight to Watkins when he needed to be aggressive. Didn't give them any room. They headed everything away. And they look like right now the centre back pairing. It'd be interesting to see what Steve Cooper does going forward because obviously the mix between the back three, the personnel, those two look like they does, they're going to go on a run in the side. You, you'd have to after those performances. I know Niakati got sent off the other week, but they have to play. I mean, it's like, you know, Kenny Burns and Des Walker reincarnated <laughs> as a pairing, not to get too over the top. But it did feel like that. Sometimes when you just. You can go over the top in your head about stuff, but sometimes you just it just feels like that. You feel like the crowd is connecting with those defenders as well. They're mm. appreciating their performances. And it's just so much about the game. I'm sure we're going to get into more detail about it. But also with the Adam Johnson thing in the second half, the timing of that moment straight after the goal, it was it, it was it was it was it was again a beautiful thing to witness. And mm. Even and at, right at the end of the game, it almost felt like Villa said, "You know what? We've had enough of this. It's time to go home." Even yeah. in added time, I think they were moving the ball around. Like, just ref, just blow the whistle. We need to move on. <laughs> We've got other games. Don't, don't need to come here again. <laughs> um, there's lots to unpack there. All, all mm. exactly right what you say. I probably just go back to the point about the atmosphere because we've spoken on the podcast quite a few times this season that it hasn't quite felt like it did last season when it was so lauded. For probably a couple of reasons for me, like first, the expectation that we're going to be better. And secondly, the teams we played, with all due respect, haven't been the ones where you hope you might win rather than you expect to win. And this, for me, was the first game where there was that real jeopardy and we felt like we hoped we'd win. So I suppose the question is, did it feel to you 
coming back to the ground like it was the city ground of last season more. 100% agree. I think you look at the home matches you've had, you know, the disappointment of Luton, disappointment of Burnley and Brentford. And you look at those matches, you think, actually, the fans would have been coming to those games thinking, we should win this game or get something from this game. That's the position you're in. So, yes, this was the first game against a team where a lot of the supporters would, would have been thinking, oh, we'll have to play well today. You know, they're really in form. You know, Diaby and Watkins running the show at the moment for Villa. Their midfield looks strong. But uh, I don't know. There was something niggling away at the back of my mind that having seen Forrest earlier in the season, I mean, the Luton result seems so against what I'd seen in terms of thought. It was strange to think in this particular game, I felt that they had it in them, Forrest, to turn it on in this way. They, they have the players. I've said it before. The individual talent is there to play this way. So it's not a case of players going above or beyond their ability. They have this ability. Now, they've not, done it across 90 minutes this season. You know, they've had games where they've had moments, started relatively well against Brentford, but then faded and came back a bit in the second half. I mean, the Burnley game was like that. So at home, it felt like they needed a performance like this and they got it in the Villa game. And I, I agree. I mean, having Ina's goal scored in that fashion that early helped massively mm. straight away on top of the occasion. It, I mean, it just added to it. One of the things I'd written down in my notes was around still the volume of change at Forest. I know, obviously, it was 30 signings last season, 11 this season, but statistically, Forest have used more players than any other team this season. They've changed their lineup more than anyone else. And it still feels to me like it's very much a work in progress. I know fans want us to be higher in the league straight away, but does it? do you still see signs in that performance and what you've seen from this season that, Steve Cooper's still got a lot of work to do to get exactly where he wants them to be. It's, it's not easy, is it? Every game, Forest game I've done, there's either a debut or yeah. somebody's not played for a while. And it's it's just incredible. I thought, you know, I thought, are we going to get it this time around? But no, changing the goalkeeper. It's just, it's fascinating. And I think our knees injury and trying to return from that is is a big important part of this because to lose wood at the same time is tricky because that focal point I think is so important to the way they play. So you're looking at, I think he knows he's starting to develop a core to his side minus the goalkeeper, which is a, you know, a big part of that. Um, going forward, you'd fancy that he's got his first choice defenders. Now that might be complicated and Felipe comes back. We'll see, but they look to be those two settled now of course you don't want to jump the gun too much but you've got to if a team's a winning team and a two and players are playing well and a unit's playing well at the center back part you've got to keep them and arguably the midfield now i understand that there'll be calls from some quarters for yates to be playing a bit more and and i think part of that is obviously his connection to the club and how committed he is on the pitch and that people want that almost they want that in the game, but you look at that midfield now and you feel like that's what he's going to want to build on. I think Sangari and Mangala, you know, strong performances against Aston Villa again. Dominguez has got something about him as well. And then it's and then Gibbs White in that team, you know, he offers a bit of the, he's the cut and thrust that you need in that side. Uh, mm. And he's got the quality. I mean, he's unfortunate in many ways. He has so many moments where, and nearly moments for him that if they made, if he'd pulled them off, it'd be headline news. You know, you think of the Palace, the goal he could have scored at Palace, you know, that would have been one of the goals of the of the month at the very least. So he's, he's, he's almost so close there. He needs more things to happen for him in terms of headline moments, Gibbs White, to then even get into the conversation of England caps and things like that. Because obviously, unfortunately for him, he's competing in an area where Jude Bellingham reigns. So... <laughs> No, not even James Madison could get in that that region, so that's asking much. But still, from his point of view, he's another fixture in the side. And then you look in the front line, Awani, and then you've got the injuries in those wide areas. So that's that's that knocks it a bit. Mm. But you're trying to settle on a starting eleven. Now we know you could ask: Does Pep Guardiola have a settled starting eleven? Arguably not, really. But you know at least seven or eight players who are going to start every game. And that's where you need to be. 
you don't almost don't want to know their team every single week because the opposition would know the team every single week. You want to though have that core group, which you do want to be the centre back pairing. You do want to be the heart of your midfield and probably your front line forward. But if you can rotate the the wingers and the fullbacks, I don't see that as a problem. And I think that's maybe the position for us to get themselves in at the moment. The fullbacks a mix and mix and match, and and maybe the front line is an area to look at. Of the injuries have played a part and lessen that depth, but they are getting there. But they, are, they have got a lot of players. I mean, we can't we can't hide from that. Uh, and that is probably Steve Cooper's biggest challenge. But I think any manager, even though they would say they've got a lot of players, I think they prefer to have a lot of quality around. Any manager mm. would want that. Because mm. if you get injuries, then you just say, well, just, just bring them in. So it's a good place to be. I think it's a better feeling about the the number of players and then maybe were a year. In fact, definitely was a year ago. I think people are probably more comfortable with it now. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. The style's evolving as well. We saw that first goal, fullback to fullback, playing through the thirds. We didn't really see much of that last season, apart from the equaliser against Man City, which was just on another level out of nowhere. But, you know, generally... I mean, that game was, to be honest. Like... <laughs> yes, certainly. <laughs> How you got a point from that game? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I know, Haaland's had one of his off days, luckily. Yeah. Right? yeah but, but generally, it does feel like we're an evolving team. I mean, Tyro does feel like the key to it all to me. His hold up play, his pace. He, he, when he arrived at Forest, I remember people saying that he had the raw ingredients, but he was a million miles off being a rounded striker. But now I feel like mm. he's made such big strides to be where he is now. I suppose I was one of the things I was going to ask you while you were talking, I was thinking, like, where does Taiwo rank in terms of Premier League quality now when you see him mm-hmm. when he's fit and firing? Because I thought he played at 70% on sat- Sunday and still looked really good. Well, he looks like he enjoys himself as well. You see, even when he puts a pass astray, he's got he's got that smile on his face, almost like you know, well, I'll have a go next time. I'll get it next time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they look for him. The players look for him. They know he's always an option. I mean, the number of times Villa had that high line, and you just wanted that pass to go in behind. And maybe maybe we're overplaying this factor about high lines in terms of the because teams have high lines. The whole whole point is to put pressure on the team on the ball. And to squeeze on them, which is why the Spurs one seems so so crazy because they had fewer players on the pitch. But I could see that's what Villa are trying to do, and that works really well at home. But then away from home, it can be exploited, of course, because you it's hard to dominate a team away from home mm. unless you're Manchester City. So it's hard to do that. So that's maybe where Villa will think about it again. Maybe they came into the game thinking we should win this game. Or if we play our game the way we want to play it, we should be too much for Forrest. And they quickly found out that wasn't the case on the day. Um, but maybe the players, maybe there was enough pressure on the ball on the Forest midfield that meant they couldn't exploit that as much as they could have done. Because it seemed to be on almost every time that when they won that ball from deep, they could get it forward quickly and there'd be runners in behind. And, and they probably didn't exploit that enough. But they won the game ultimately. You know, that's part of it. But you were going to say, sorry, you're saying about Awani in terms of other Premier League strikers. I think, again, you're saying, what, where are you placing Forrest in what category in the league? Are you saying yeah, strikers yeah. in the top six? Are you saying the mid table strikers? Are you saying relegation rivals? How, how are you looking at it? Who, who, who would you? Well, I wouldn't pit him up against Haaland, obviously, or <laughs> um, well, maybe I would piss him against Darwin Nunes. I don't know. But it, yeah, in that bracket, say from. West Ham down to Everton, ninth to 16th. I mean, I feel like he's the best of them without thinking too much. I mean, Calvert-Lewin, when he's fit, maybe. I'm thinking off the top of my head here. but Well, I, well, I would ask you, Calvert-Lewin, when he's fit, would you have him over Owen-E? No, I wouldn't. Yeah. So Brentford have got Tony, obviously, when he returns. Yeah, and he, I, he is elite, and I would say that... I mean, I think he should have go him. to an Arsenal or something like that. I, 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 no disrespect to Brentford, but when you yeah, see him yeah. play, his all-round game is, is above... Uh, a mid-table yeah. Premier League team. I mean, the problem is that if I look, I'm just looking now at the mid-table in the Premier League and Manchester United and Chelsea are in there. So we throw... Yes. <laughs> we throw well, I'd definitely take by Nicholas Jackson. I mean, I've not seen a yeah, worse but... trick in my life. <laughs> I think, do you know what? I think it's a it's a fair shout because you look through that and you think Fulham need a number nine, Wolves need a number nine, West Ham arguably still need a number nine, Palace mm. have had issues in that trying to get, trying to, they could strengthen in that area. So, yes, I think it's a fair shout. I think Awani, 
even him being absent and even f- not fully fit, you can see his importance to the team. Mm. And and actually, he is in the side the way that uh, that Forrest are playing. He is the perfect striker for that. I think at the moment because mm. he mm. can run the channels, he can hold the ball up, and he has to. Almost, I think I guess from his point of view, there's going to be an element of he has to be the battering ram sometimes, and other players might gain from him doing that. You know, Gibbs White might gain from layoffs and him flicking the ball on and things like that. Or other midfield runners, say D- Danilo, when he's back fully fit in, in the first team, which is another debate as well. Mm. Where does Danilo, where do you put Danilo in? The, who misses out for Danilo? Mm. Yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, um, Darren Fletcher on Monday was saying if Danilo was fit to play for longer as a midfield runner from deep, he might have sprung that offside trap. And he's the one that offers that, you know, more of a traditional box to box presence. So maybe in the horses for courses for game, he, he would come in. And then Yates as the fifth choice is, yeah, pretty pretty impressive. So it does feel like things are certainly moving in the right direction. You're right there, definitely. Um, just going back, in fact, we'll go back to the back end of the pitch about the goalkeeping situation. You've seen a lot of Turner. <laughs> you see, we've all seen Vlaconimos mm. for one game, or I have anyway. Mm. I've seen him play for Greece. I felt like he had a much more of a presence and a calmness for whatever reason, but I don't want to get too ahead of just, you know, the sample size is so small, well, but do you have any early thoughts on, on that goalkeeping situation? I think it's, look, we've got a goalkeeper here who should have been, who would have been playing in the Champions League if he hadn't signed for Forrest, right? Mm-hmm. So he's got, he's a player of that sort of, that level. And Turner, effectively, his European experience has been, you know, Europa League games for Arsenal. And now he was coming into, now when it first happened, I thought, that's not a bad signing for Forrest. I was a bit confused about the goalkeeping situation because I wondered if they go in for Henderson again, would they try and get another keeper on loan? It seemed a bit of an awkward area. Um, to me, Blackademos seems like he seems more of a number one than Turner at this, mm. this point in time. And he didn't... It's always difficult for a goalkeeper's first game because there's always going to be an element of nerves. And I was actually surprised that the they didn't play it back to him a bit more often. But I think that's because the game plan for Forrest was to get the ball forward quickly. There's no sense of building from the back or anything like that. It was get it forward quickly uh, to, to exploit Villa's high line. So he never, he did, didn't maybe get as many touches as he would have liked in the opening 10 minutes or so. But he was busy enough in the game and he was solid enough. It's so early, isn't it? It's And I, I feel for Turner a bit because goalkeepers always make mistakes. It's always going to be a point when a goalkeeper makes a mistake. But he's had some incidents in recent weeks that, you know, put it that way, the manager had to had to do something about it. With a goalkeeper like that on the bench, he had to give Blackademos a chance. He had to. So, you know, the, mis- the error last time out for Turner, and then obviously don't forget the, he probably sh- should have conceded a penalty against Brentford. Um, mm. You know, these little moments are tricky. Has he been solid enough to, say, justify those mistakes, keeping allowing him to keep his place in the team? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. And he hasn't got that. He has, Unfortunately for him, he hasn't got enough behind him in English football to for people to say, oh, you know, but he's having an off time. But, you know, last season he was brilliant for us. Or, he just hasn't had that, you know. He's, he's a US national team goalkeeper. But that's not on the radar of people in this country. So it's hard for him in that. It'll be interesting to see though, what happens now. Does Cooper just stick with Lacademos now he's that now he's made that change. And we had this debate about goalkeepers in this season. It's reared its head because of Arsenal's situation, but mm. you feel like now he's in to stay for a period until he has a few howlers, which is, what a, ter- what a terrible situation for goalkeepers to be in. It's sort of like, oh, okay, play until you keep making errors. Um, yes, I mean, I think he's... It also helps when you keep a clean sheet, you win a game at home. As a goalkeeper, how can people criticise you after that? Mm, they they yeah. can't, can they? No, I agree. I feel like he's he's the number one now. Like, even we see, like, at, at, you mentioned Arsenal. Like, David Rea hasn't looked amazing, but you feel like... He's Arteta's man and he's made his bed and now he's going to lie in it. And I think it feels like the same with Vlacodimos or Vlacodimos, I hear you saying. I've been pronouncing it wrong. Yeah. Um, Do you know what? It's, it's just that I'm talking about pronunciation of, of, of a name like that. Now, ultimately, I always say to myself, look, you're never going to be 100% because I'm not Greek. 
yeah mm. and i'm not him so actually in a weird way it's a slight it's a slight stress change even the way you said it there to where i said it it's subtle you mm. say vlakodimos vlakodimos mm. it's, there's there's not much in it so any accident if I, but i and commentary i always say this trying to force an accent onto a name to make it as authentic as possible affects your overall commentary mm. it makes it it makes it sound strange because most of the players you know i'm not a native speaker in any of those languages so if i'm adding an accent to a name part of it's going to be offensive some people are going to say oh you're doing a good job at trying to do it most people are like what's he talking about or oh, i don't understand him i've lost him give an example if you know just a name that springs to mind because you know santi cazola if I was to try and attempt to say Santi Cazola, you know, yes, and put yeah. that into a commentary, now I might be having more of an attempt to, to nail it in a Spanish accent and pronounce it correctly, but actually it's difficult. You need to be in tune with the rest of your speech as much as possible. So you're trying to be as phonetically correct as possible, but also not force yourself out of it too much. Um, mm. Actually, interestingly, the striker, so Awani, is an interest, interesting situation because I work for the Premier League and a lot of Nigerian people, when you work with games like that, they come to you and they, they'll say, oh, can can you say it like this? Everyone in England says, uh, Awanyi. Everyone in England says, Awanyi. It's mm. Awanyi. It's like a double E at the end. Mm. And when it's like that, you'll be like, do you know, that's fine. I can do that. That doesn't change my accent to go Awanyi. You know, if it, mm. but if there's more of a difference in that, then that might change it. And um it's, it's an interesting aspect of commentary. It definitely is pronunciations because whatever way you do it, somebody's going to be annoyed. I remember once trying to be authentic with a name and people were, people were like, that's not how you say his name. That's not how you say his name. Blah, 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 blah. So you can't really win. You can never win in that dynamic. I think of like mm -hmm. Kevin, Kevin De Bruyne. That's how everyone knows him. But his name is more of like a De Bruyne or you yes. know, it's not quite that. But for me to switch to that now, it would feel odd because it's so entrenched and you're only drawing attention to you to the situation you're trying not to do that as a commentator too much you know the game is the most important thing and you're just trying to make the game more exciting i don't mm. want people sat there thinking why is he trying to do a greek accent why is he trying <laughs> you know those sort of stuff but yeah you know there's no this it's all subjective yeah, you don't want to go full football Italia, do you? Like Fiorentina and all that <laughs> no, stuff. No. Here's a quick inside question then for commentators. Mm. Does the Premier League send out like an audio database or anything for of, of players pronouncing their names or anything like that to give you a head start? Yeah. So we get we get as many so the players the, the teams before the season, they will all say their name to camera. When I say yeah. all, sometimes you know a player might not be there or a player joins a bit later. Mm. But I've always said the way the main issue with that is that if you as an individual, if I was say playing in Brazil, and I was used to people saying my name with a, in a certain way, I'd probably then just say it like that, so that people in Brazil would understand me. So we have an instant situation where so Vincent Company says his name anglicised, and then he says it. You know, in his native in his native accent, you should, mm. you should say, you know, Vincent. But he doesn't want he doesn't want to do that because he's so he lives in England now, he works in England now, and he feels like Vincent Company, and I can accept that. Now there might be other people who wouldn't want that. And um, we have another player I'm not going to say now, but they they pronounce their name wrong as a joke. <laughs> so you can imagine everybody was saying their name wrong, and they they've said it as a joke. Mm. Um, we've got situations like Harland, for example, in Norway. They'll say like Holland, but the family wants him known as Harland mm. because he was born in Leeds, pretty mm. much. You know, that's how. So we do get that. And I think it's helpful for certain names if, if people have absolutely nowhere to grip onto. But again, nothing's ever 100% because you can never nail an accent truly. I'll give you another example is Newcastle, Newcastle. Depending on what part of England you're from, you say the name differently. Now, being from the South, if I say, I keep saying Newcastle all the time, that's fine. But my intuition is to say Newcastle because that's my accent. Mm. So am I wrong for saying Newcastle? People in Newcastle might say, oh, you know, yeah, you should try and do it that way. But then 
at the same time, it might stick out too much to other people. And they're saying, why is he trying to trying to be like from up north? Or, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's trying to hide this, that and the other. So I, I, I always go a bit, can I say it? Can I say the name in my accent? Does it work? And if it works, then that's fine. But you, but the nature of a commentator is you're never going to win because there's always going to be a divisive element about stuff. You know, any game, you know, you mentioned if teams are winning, then people obviously, th oh, they love the commentary on that sort of thing. But if you're, it's your team getting battered, you might not appreciate someone getting excited about your team conceding. So it's an emotional, it's an emotional game, that's for sure. Um, just quickly, continuing loosely on the theme of names then. We're probably all saying Murillo wrong. It should be Murillo or something. But um, I've got, I'm totally convinced that he's going to play for an absolutely elite club in the next five years. I just see all the ingredients. Not, for, not Forest then. Do you, you're not putting Forest in elite club. Are they, are they an elite club? But everyone's <laughs> a selling club unless you're, well, yeah. even Barcelona are a selling club now. But yeah, yeah I think he's going to go to that, that level eventually. Am I getting carried away? Are you going to? Put my feet on the ground a bit. Now you've seen him four or five times. I, I, you know what? I won't do I think defenders is one of the hardest positions to predict that in because, again, you know, a few errors, high-profile errors from defenders can cost teams matches. Whereas if you're a forward, a young forward, you can have flashes of brilliance, then have an off day, flashes of brilliance. But it might not necessarily cost your team in the same way. Murillo, you think he could play next week, he could have a blinder, and then, like you said, he handles the ball. It's a penalty. He misplaces mm. a back pass. He misses a, a header, whatever it might be. And then he's in the spotlight. And defenders often mature later on. And because they learn, it's about a consistency of performance for centre-backs. Mm. So when you have centre-backs that stand out, say Saliba at Arsenal, being a, a young defender, that's when people maybe do go over the top about those players and think, oh, this is special because for a centre-back to be this good at this age is quite something. So that's why I'd say you're not wrong to get excited about Marilo because he is standing out and it's only a handful of matches, but he looks like he has the tools. And I remember speaking to a Brazilian journalist about this, Corinthian supporter, and she was saying they were, you know, they were, they were gutted to lose him really. And they think they could have held him on for a bit longer, maybe got some more money from him. But also he felt like, oh, we've got a real gem here. And they just didn't get to see him enough. Mm. And it's almost obviously Forrest and he's like, I'm not saying they're saying he's one of their own because he's from Brazil, but there's that sentiment about it. Oh, we've got this young defender who's going to come through at Forest, And the Corinthian supporters are like, no, no, I, no, he's ours, he's ours. And that's always a good sign when you see the way the selling club fans behave about when they see a player go, you know you're on to one. Mm. And it's timing as well to come into the team where I think the centre-back partnership has never really been properly sorted. Um, and you look at it and you think, now is it sorted? You know, McKenna sat in the stands. Worrell's not involved. You think, are these players actually, is Joe Worrell going to really get much of a look in as it goes forward? Is he going to be, because centre-back subs, how often do you have centre-backs coming on as subs unless there's an injury or, or you're mm. trying to see out a game? That might mm. be Worrell's role. Um, yeah, yeah. It'd be yeah. nice. I, I think, you know, players like Worrell and Yates, you want, I think you keep them in the squad as long as feasibly possible. Mm. Even if they get you bringing superior players, just having those players who understand the club in the mix is so important. And hopefully they can help Don Tamarilla so then he feels, I'm Forrest now. This is my team now. And when the bigger guns come calling, then you can either go, you can either say, well, he's now worth 200 million or make it difficult for him to want to leave and he stays on that extra season. Um, mm. You have to be doing well for that. But yeah, he's, yeah. he's definitely, a, of the younger players, he's probably, well, he could be the most excited one, exciting one, I'd say, of that team. Yeah, I think the reasons, there's a few reasons that he stands out to me. Firstly, obviously he showed that quality at Palace and it's all razzmatazz, that run, those pinging those balls. But more so, the Villa game, there was none of that. He was just an excellent defender. I thought that was spot on. And then little things like you mentioned Worrell, he had made a massive rick against Luton and Murillo was the first one over to him, showing some maturity and leadership. So I just see all those signs. And he made a rick against Liverpool. You mentioned he he made that run into midfield. And you can argue quite rightly that Bolly and Niakate should have covered him better. But it, for me, it wasn't the right time to do it. But he didn't, it didn't affect him and he put in that performance against Villa. So yeah, I think you're right. And, and Brentford as well. Do you think the back, the, the back end of the Brentford game when you're down to 10, Yes, and he's quite, just trying yeah. to see, get a yeah, get a point in that game. He was he dug in and he looked. I think that's what's special about him is he 
he enjoys all the facets of being a centre back. Mm. So he likes to go on the runs, but he enjoys the defending, and he seems yeah. to be that's such. I think for a centre back of that age, that is such a good sign that they're concentrating because, like I say, you can get all excited and and wander about and think you're imperious and you've got something over it, but it's that one error at the back that's going to cost you. So mm. concentration is the biggest aspect of of centre half play, having you know viewed it. Yeah, and I think you're right about Ryan and Joe as well. Steve Cook was on on here. I think it was over the summer talking about you know the importance of having them in the squad and obviously the team probably is moving in a different direction that they're not going to be regulars necessarily. I still think Yates is going to play a lot of games, but perhaps more so Joe. But like Wall's very durable. He's probably touch wood the only defender that doesn't get injured, so there's definitely to room for him to be in the squad. And I, I like Toffolo coming into that bracket. I know he's mm-hmm. not a Forest through and through, but he's posting videos of his kid on Twitter singing "Well of Kintyre" in the kit and. Yeah, he seems like a good play. That's one of the things. Yeah. That... Can I say something about Toffolo? Because I find it fascinating that obviously you beat Huddersfield in the playoff. You go for the double swoop, the Huddersfield players, and that felt right. At the t- it felt like, okay, I see what you're doing there. But because of the number of signings in that window, it, fe- it started to feel, what was the point in those two signings? Mm. That's what it felt like a bit. Mm. And it's almost, obviously he's got the off the field issues, but having come back into the team, come into the team now, and he feels like that Cooper wants wants to have him in his side. Mm. And he, again, he thought he was very good in, in, you know, he's been very good in his recent games. And, you know, Ina having to switch to the other side, we know Ina can play on either side of that. It's again, really useful. We know that Aurier's had a, you know, a rebirth in the Premier League playing at Forest. So, is it, and, I mean, I was, I've got to say, I, I was shocked with uh, in the, the Burnley game to have a, a World Cup winning right back who scored the winning penalty in a World Cup and for him to be that poor in that game. And that was quite yeah. shocking. <laughs> like, I mean, his, injury, his injury is quite timely because I wonder if he was fit, would he even be playing anyway? Mm. Is there pressure to play him? I don't know. Mm. He might struggle to get into the team when he's back. Yeah, there's a few what's the point signings. Like Andre Santos... Uh, obviously, they signed Sangari and Dominguez after him. And yeah, he doesn't look like he's going to get a kick. And like you say with O'Brien. But I think this is one of Cooper's great strengths. So having to do all these players, and they still look like a team. I mean, I don't think there's many mm. managers that will be able to keep all these players happy for this long. Obviously, he's shipped out Dennis and Shelby and mm. shown a ruthless streak there. But I think his man management, that's why I think he's such a good manager, really. Tactically, you can point out a few things, but... I think Forrest, you know, as long as they keep Steve Cooper this season, I know some fans will disagree oh, with yeah. this, but I think they'll yeah. they'll be fine. I think the, the curve is only upwards with Definitely. him still. Definitely. I think, and I know there was, even before this Villa game, if they'd had been on the end of a heavy defeat, again, he would have come under a lot of pressure. Mm. I and mean, that's, unfortunately, I think that's the, the power of the Luton result has had a lot of power in recent, it, it's, it's a, because to be in the position you're in, to throw it away to Luton, who everybody's expecting to go straight back down with not many points, but they they themselves have proved that's not the case, actually. They'll fight till the end and they'll pick up mm. points when they can. Um, I, I think that has a big bearing on all of this. That's how it felt. Um, you know, you write off a trip to Anfield in many ways. You, you know, you move on from that. And they've had some... Really difficult away games this season as well, Forrest. You think about that run, and but all those teams have got to come to the city ground. And last season, they all struggled there pretty much. So mm. let's see if it happens again. And they probably, arguably, Forrest are a better team now than they were mm. last season. So can they build on that? The flip side is teams know that now. They know how Forrest are going to play. But I think Forrest have. I said it last time about the Brentford game. They've got an element of Brentford about the way they play, in that. They have the tools there to trouble the top teams. You know, there's a lot of power in that team. There's a lot of pace in that team. They've got a good effect. They can could counter pretty well. And whether they've got the ability against teams that might sit off them a bit is a different matter. And that's probably reflected in the results, that the lack of wins against those teams, a lot of draws in those games. And that's probably where Forest are. Do they prefer to play teams that on paper look better than them? That'd be mm. quite interesting to see by the end of the season if they pick up more points against teams above them than below them if they finish in mid-table, of course. Mm. That kind of 
leads into the last topic, which I've last 10 minutes or so around better teams, tactics, high lines, just the evolution of the game. I mean, we saw Spurs v Chelsea was mental. I hated the first half, to be honest, because the ball was never in play. But I love the second half mm. with the mad approach from Postacoglu. I think he's great. And I'll ask you about Postacoglu in a minute. But just mm. in general, do you see you know every season the game evolving from your commentary position with inverted fullbacks, crazy high lines? It feels like the game's always changing, getting faster to me. Yeah, it's, it just keeps going in circles, football. That's how it feels. Players are obviously get a fitter, stronger than they ever have been. And there are many people who say that takes away with a, away from the bit of the magic of the game. You know, the old school number 10s, the players that have time on the ball. Everything seems to be in a rush now. Again, unless you're Manchester City, who <laughs> sometimes find the time to, to do things. But everything seems to be in a in a rush now. Everything's played at a, such a high tempo, and those one those subtle things can can can. Well, I say subtle. There's nothing subtle about those high lines. I think both both Villa and Spurs operating that way. I think I saw more in the way Villa were playing for it to make sense, and obviously Spurs in the first 10, 15 minutes of the game. But what made that game so extraordinary was I just never seen. A team approach a game like that when they've gone a player down yeah yeah and then to go two down and then on top of that the players he was able to bring on you know Spurs have a problem in defensive depth you know they mm -hmm. they have you know Dyer is basically the only reserve centre back at the moment you know they'd have to bring in uh, the, the youngster Phillips in so that's the, so but they're, so they're bringing him on bringing in players to have to be makeshift centre halves as well against a team with extra men on the field and a team with pace up front as well. I mean, I, I couldn't believe in the second half. Mudrik, I, I could not believe how he didn't wasn't able to exploit it more than he, oh, he, than he, than he did. Yeah. It, it was, it was incredible. Was yeah, I just thought, I just found it astonishing. It was almost like, I think maybe Chelsea were just shocked. Mm. It was like, I cannot believe that, you know, in, in your situation, this is, oh my God, I got the freedom of, got the freedom of Tottenham Stadium what is going on here and it took them a while to click so obviously towards the back end of the game they were getting in and the goals were scored I mean one of the look you still look, you still have to give credit credit to Jackson for finishing the chances off you know, still have to put the ball in the net but as a striker I mean you couldn't wish for a better situation mm. to be in and he's probably actually sat there thinking I could have had five um Little so yeah. yeah he could have done yeah I, mean, I think Chelsea I don't think you can read anything into that from Chelsea's point of view, except for their the fact that at the start of the game, they because Spurs came flying out the block, so maybe we were a little bit over eager. Certainly, it was funny. A doggy and and Romero both went flying into a couple of challenges, and you know, there's an argument they could have gone earlier, both of them. And there was that energy about Spurs, and you thought, are oh, Chelsea going to be able to resist this? Went behind, and they fought back quite well, Chelsea actually. Uh, and that was where the credit was. So it would have been interesting if Spurs had kept the players on the pitch. We could have ended up with a sort of 4-4 four, four game. Um, mm. So it, it's possible to know. But yes, you're right. The first half, it was really, it was broken up so much. I mean, VAR, as a commentator, I have the, the video assistant referee in my ear whenever they speak to the referee. And John Brooks was in my ear constantly, all the time, checking absolutely everything. And I think this is the, the effect on officials because they don't want to be in a situation what happened to Darren England. They don't want to be in that position again. So they're over-checking almost everything. There were so many things off the ball. Oh, just checking, checking this chat challenge, checking that challenge. And how many disallowed goals were there in the game? It was unbelievable. But then you think if you take VAR away, how would that have played out? And maybe mm. also VAR is playing a part in the way teams are playing. Because if you're playing a high line, you knowing that VAR is there, you can play on that edge because you think you could maybe VAR can save you by playing that high. If you play a high line without VAR, you're all, always at the discretion of the assistant, aren't you? Mm. And you're playing that aggressive approach. You might several times get that wrong quite a lot. And you think Chelsea had goals disallowed for offside a few times, but maybe... Maybe they would have they would have scored more goals without VAR being there. That's the situation. And yeah. to take it back to what you were saying, you know, 
the general change in the game. I think you'll always have different varieties and different approaches to football. And I say that if you look at company and you look at Mariska in a situation where if you've got the best players in the league and you want to mirror style, so then they're, I wouldn't say mirror, but their their influence is, is Pep Guardiola. I, I My belief, having seen it play out, is you can only attempt that style if you have mm. players of the level required. Mm. If you don't, you have to adapt. Mm. Because when I think of when City have fallen foul in recent years, maybe not last season because they were imperious, but they often there seem to be two things. Either a team had slightly better players doing better things in a better moment, you know, you think back to two seasons ago when City played Real Madrid in the semi-finals and Fernandinho was forced out to right back, for example, and Vinicius had a field day. You know, little moments like that is where you could get at City. And the other thing is teams having an, having pace dynamism in their front line so that when the ball breaks quickly, they could break quickly and counter on them and having a low block and sticking to it, but with good players to do it. You know, Spurs have been successful in doing that against City. But it's horse. Uh, I don't like the phrase horses for courses, particularly in this, because it's more than that. But you have to play with the players you have in mind. And that's where squad building comes in and, and, and trying to fit a system. You know, Arsenal are trying to do that. Players have to play in your mould. You have different ways of doing it and understanding that. You know, Ten Hag is, having, is understanding that at the moment. Maybe how he wants to play, the players aren't there at Manchester United or they haven't adapted as he would have liked because he's had a few signs he's had a couple of windows now so yes I don't think it, I don't think football's heading in any direction from what I've seen but I think managers certainly want to tr go on their way and they need to create a squad that reflects that and I think that's what Emery's done at Villa it's not always going to work for them though that's the mm. situation they're going to meet teams where that just doesn't work for them and they met one last weekend obviously yeah I think I've said this to people at Leicester. I'm glad you said that. I'm saying you're so right. I watched Leicester play three or four times a season. And my, my only conclusion is you're going to win the league by a mile and then you're going to get absolutely murdered in the Premier League playing that way. It's just unless they buy players and if they buy a whole new set of players to cope with that. Yeah. Which Burnley haven't been able to do. No. And no. you can see Burnley you can see Burnley's struggles. I've done a few Burnley games this season. You can see the problem they're going to have because actually Luton's way might bear more fruit. Now, Luton mm. don't have as much quality, even as Burnley do, but they understand their assignment yeah. <laughs> and who they're facing. You know, they get the assignment. You, you need you need a quality of player to stay in the Premier League. And I think all the three that have come up don't have that quality to mm. be anywhere remotely, think they're going to be comfortable and they're going to struggle, be against it. Look at Bournemouth, they've got the same situation. New managers come in, as a style he wants to play, but maybe the players aren't aren't of what's required not necessarily quality but aren't adapted to that style just yet and will he get the time to ever get that to that point Pro probably not no i think you're so right like sheffield united the only goals they score are absolute screamers or penalties i haven't seen them score anything else and that's not sustainable <laughs> i actually think luton are the best of the four to stay up because a well, long yeah, ball in the yeah. box is a long ball in the box and i admire like i think Dowd is decent and morris is decent and they're organized I think Edwards is a really good coach. So if I had to pick one of the four, unless Burnley sat company, then I would, yeah, they, I would say Luton have the best shot. Yeah, but if Burnley sat company, then it's, uh, the new manager comes in and wants to change the style. Are the players able to do that? Because he has been bringing in players yeah. to Technical play in that way. Yeah. It's, not, it's not easy. I think it's difficult for them. But of course, as a Forest supporter, this is music to your ears because it means mm. the chances of you going down are are very slim at this point in time. Mm. And actually, does that give you a cushion to think, right, okay, all right, let's uh, let's make a push for the what, what West Ham are trying to do and what Brentford are trying to do, and who knows what Brighton are trying to do? You know, mm. you need that base. You need to feel relatively comfortable in the Premier League to then push on. I think mm. to have the confidence to go again in terms of just the ownership saying, right, we're going to go for this type of player now. Uh, to give that base. If you're not sure, if you think we're going to get sucked into a relegation battle, then it's hard, isn't it, to 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 ever have that feeling of comfort. Not that you ever get that in football, I guess. Yeah. that's. Let me finish on that topic then, because it's a good note to end on. The next three games are West Ham, Brighton, Everton, which I feel is a really good yardstick of where we are. Because I could see Forrest winning all three, but 
I can mm. see them <laughs> slipping up and losing, not losing all three necessarily, because I think West Ham are defensively poor. And I don't see us losing at home to Everton, but they are a decent side. But basically, all three are decent Premier League sides and Brighton are good. So, uh, what are you going to give me pause for thought of, you know, uh, where Forest are? Does this, uh, yeah. Is this a red flag for you, these games, or is it a, an opportunity? Yeah, no, I think... Yeah, I think all three are red flags. I think you, you, I would look at all three. If, and as you say, if you came out at the end of it and Forrest have picked up three wins, I would actually be surprised because I think yeah. Brighton are a tough nut for Forrest to crack necessarily this season, this point in time. Now, of course, there was that famous win at the back end of last season. Mm. But I think that was also to play in the fact where the teams were at that point in time. It was, mm. it was, it was a diff, bit different. Um but yeah, it's, it, if you came with three wins, I'd be surprised with the three wins because of the opposition. But that's only because actually looking at the three, now you think about it, the Everton game seems the biggest banana skin because again, it's Forest at home against a team where fans will be confident they'll win. Yeah. With the with the atmosphere drop for that particular game. <laughs> again, mm. You know, thinking, oh, whereas a way to, a way to West Ham, that's a, that's a, that's a tricky one. Because even though people criticise that stadium, it does have an effect on 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 the opposition. They do tend to do quite well there, West Ham. They do pick up some good results there. You think in recent, even this season, I did them at home to Manchester City, and they played really well in that game. Mm. And they were unfortunate that they were playing Manchester City, but actually, they actually played really well. And they can turn it on in that stadium and and make something happen. But then again, they faced Everton recently, and it all went wrong. They are very difficult side to to judge they've certainly got the tools to trouble forest but you could say there's an element of aston villa about them as well in that you might turn up on the day and exploit this is the nature of football isn't it predictions yeah absolute waste of time um yeah like, that's we're seeing already Kudos i would have been a really you know, good player isn't he at west Ham, Kudos, yeah but... yeah exactly and again he's a classic case of a player who i think seems set to probably go to chelsea but they didn't Hmm. You know, they were signing so many players that he didn't quite make the cut at the right time. And he'll be another player where West Ham fans are looking at him and thinking, oh, actually, we've got a bit of a gem here. And hmm. um, But he might be of that level whereby he's an excellent player who will stay at West Ham for a period of time in that he'll excel for them in the same way that Bowen is doing at the moment. And that he, they won't teams won't quite make that gamble of the money required to get him out of there. You think of even Declan Rice, the money required to get Declan Rice out of West Ham was, you know, north of a hundred million. So will he ever be in that position? Who knows? Will Murillo become the first 100 million pound centre back? I was thinking about, I was thinking about Taiwo again there actually, because I think he might <laughs> oh, yeah. be, 100 million, 100 million. No, no, in terms of sticking at Forest, actually, because will teams mm. take a punt on a guy with a rough injury record who, you know, he hasn't completed 90 minutes, but he's brilliant for Forest. But is he, a, would you gamble? What would you say? No, no. 60 no, I, million I know, quid I, on him? I, yeah. I, I could see him staying at Forest for a long time, actually. I, I, I definitely could. I think it would be a case of, I'm trying to think of a scenario. It'd be whether he himself would want to move at one point. Because players yeah. have that power to make it right, and then hmm. doesn't seem that. I think he's he seems really happy at Forest, and they yeah. play to his strengths, and they feel like a, a club that's moving or looking up the table. But I said a big part of that is the teams below them potentially hmm. are not of Forest level. I think that's quite clear. Whereas hmm. last season there was debate about that, and there was a nervousness about that. But this season, you think there's there's I can't envisage a scenario where Either of those four clubs we mentioned, any of them finish above Forest this season. It just doesn't. In the same way, you know, we think you know, Manchester United and Chelsea had bad starts, but you never think they'd ever be in a relegation battle. There's just too much quality in their teams. They're always going to have games where they pick up points. And Forest are going to be like that. They're going to be games where they, you know, they could go to West Ham and win 1 0, and it wouldn't make headline news. That's the thing about these three matches. Whatever Forest do in these matches is not going to be top of, it's not going to headline whatever story is that weekend because mm. that's where they are mm. and the teams they're playing if they beat Brighton people might have a go at Brighton but they won't say oh it's amazing against the odds victory for Forest none of those games are like that mm. this could be this could be the nature of the club and it's and it's power but that's how it is I think it would take Forest having to I mean that's the position even if Forest 
beat Arsenal or Liverpool at home, again, I don't think it's going to be one of the most eye-catching results of the season. Mm. You know, maybe if they if they beat Man City 3-0, then, then we're talking something different. <laughs> but that's where they are. Though. And I suppose as a Forest fan, that's a good place to be, is it, at this point in the journey? I guess yeah. so, considering yeah. Yeah, two years ago, you know. Oh my God! When you think we were bottom of the championship, you know, when Cooper arrived, is we were awful. Well, we've signed so many bad players over the years, and to be where we are now, like you see, just you see Derby drawing with Crew in the FA Cup, and I'm not saying that could have been us, but it does highlight, you know, the, it could the still be you, doors of football. <laughs> and I'm not going to complain about it. Certainly, no. No. Okay. Right. Uh, we shall leave it there. I've kept Seb for long enough, but it's great to have him on board. Um, if you'd like this, do uh, like, subscribe, uh, spread the word. It all helps. We shall be back tomorrow with uh, a preview of the West Ham game and then on Monday with a review of the West Ham game. I think David Prutton is joining us for that. And at some point in those days, I shall get a haircut, I promise. And then I'll shave my beard. If I shave my beard, my hair looks massive and my face looks fat. So it's got all work in harmony like a good football team. Right, uh, Seb, thank you very much. Yep, yep, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Matt. And uh, I, I believe your game is on telly this weekend because I'm at it. Yes, yes. Uh, do check it out on uh, Sky if you can't be there. Or I should say Radio Nottingham should get on well with them as well, obviously. But yes, keep ingratiating yourself with Forest fans. So <laughs> they, they're loving you at the moment. Uh, right. Thanks very much, everyone. Have uh, a good few days and we shall see you soon. <laughs>